things are changing very quickly. We need to manage so many more topics. Forced labor, transparency, fire safety, building safety. And now we have climate change, we have due diligence. There are just so many things to manage. We're just mm. learning every day. Welcome back, everybody. Richard Baker, founder of Collect Responsibility, here today with another episode of the Sustainable Ambassador podcast. Through this series, I speak with sustainable ambassadors around the world about their work in environmental, social, and economic challenges. Focus on the work that is being done. What we're hoping to do is to engage and inspire you to take the next step in your own path. And so with that, today, I'm really excited to have Sammy Ho Dumas. She is the Social Impact and Sustainability Director at Williams & Sonoma, someone I've known for about a decade now, mainly through her previous employer and some of the work that we did. But her own career your path has been focused on CSR, social impact, sustainability, pretty much from day one. As a starting point, would you mind giving a just a, a short self-introduction about who you are and what you do? I have managed CSR and sustainability program for six American and European brands, for example, um, American Eagle Outfitters, Abercrombie & Finch, Target, and currently at uh, Williams & Sonoma. How did you get started? Like, why did you want to be a factory compliance auditor or officer? Actually, I, I think I'm just in the right place at the right time. So um, I studied political science in my undergrad, and I was very curious about the developing country. And I want to travel so much after I graduate. So I found this perfect job as an auditor that allowed me to travel to all the factory in Asia. It's just great. Whenever I'm talking to, to particularly to, to college students or to even new young professionals, I'm always telling them, get out in the field and learn as much as you can about the problems. And I'm just curious, mm -hmm. when you're out in the factories, what were some of the things that you were seeing, some of the things that you were learning that, you know, you really took away with like, wow, we've got to fix this or wow, I need to learn this tool so I can, you know, have an impact in the future. Like what, what were some things that you would see that just stand out at the time? So I think one of the most tricky things that we try to improve even today is uh, number of working hours. Because in Asia, a lot of the workers are migrant workers. They leave their hometown and want to make the most money to support their family so that they tend to work more than 60 hours per week or even up to 80, 90 hours per week. This is something sounds really serious to us looking at the supply chain, but a lot of people just want to devote the maximum number of time uh, in that period when they leave their home. Right. So I think uh, we just need to understand putting into context of what is truly risky situation. For example, if workers forced to work over time when they don't want to, then that is a serious situation. But if they are willing to work long hours, maybe um, the problem is very different. And I think yeah. how to approach and find a solution will be quite different. When you first came in, were you like super like, you know, you're beyond, you're at 42 hours and this is unsafe and this is too much. Or did you learn very early on to like have a more nuanced based on your, your own understanding your own cultural understanding of this? I would say that I learned early on because I think for the first few years in my career, I audited close to a thousand factory uh, across wow. Asia so that I get to understand the law in all the country and to get a real, real sense of when things is truly serious and severe and critical. Mm -hmm. and I remember talking to a group of factory workers in a um, dialogue program. And one of the worker talked about the first time she leave home and move to Dongguan to work for the first time. And what she didn't realize is in China, it's legal to be paid one month after the end of payroll period. But then she has no saving. And she recalled the time that she had no money even to buy lunch and dinner. And when right. she recalled that memory, she cried. All that setting, the payment is not delayed, is everything is legal requirement. But right. then when we factor in, understand human being, uh, people are not machine. And then you, we will try to understand what is the boundary between compliance and beyond compliance and something that truly right. meaningful for us to work on. Can you fix that though? I mean, or is that something that you're one of, say, maybe eight, 10, 12 brands that's at a single factory, from an emotional, maybe even sometimes a moral framework, you're like, we got to fix this. But how do you actually approach that? That's a great question. So I think we try so many things over the year. We try awareness raising, meaning uh, educate both workers and factory management to understand the legal requirement. Mm -hmm. And then sometimes uh, we, we try 
skill building so that they have the right soft skill to, to make that change. But one of the ideas that I am personally very interested in is worker empowerment. Every worker has something that are important for them in different countries, in different point of time. So they are the one to know the best what is the most important for them to advocate at that point of time. What, what did you take away from that time? Like, what do you think the skills were or the tool sets that you take away from seeing those thousands of factories? Do you think, like, what were the big takeaways for you for that time that really helped you, you know, progress in your career path? Because we cannot take the compliance or um, social performance, environmental performance and black and white. Because by the law, um, a lot of countries are just simply not enforcing their own law. So we need to interpret as when when something is truly risky as a business, like in terms yeah. of reputation or true impact, negative impact to workers and the environment. So that knowledge is really working knowledge. And then we build scorecard based on that. Um, okay. And that's something that I do uh, in in my previous role as well. So when you go into a factory, what what are the things that you were looking for that would say dangerous? What were the things that were kind of, eh, you know, acceptable, but we want to improve on? And what were the things that you were really hoping to see out of the best in class? I think in terms of um, a regular CSR compliance out of school, we look at all things related to working condition like machinery, fire safety, building safety. All those are a minimum. There, there isn't one thing is more important than the other. They are all equally important. And I think what actually makes a particular factory stand out, how they plan production planning. Because yeah. when they have a more sophisticated way to measure worker skills and productivity, they will be more able to accurately plan the hours, how many hours and tasks they have to work so that they don't have to work overtime because paying overtime yeah. premium is expensive. And then the second forward looking in the future, how a factory continue to adapt to energy efficiency, uh, resources efficiency, how they able to work with brands to improve, mm. uh, to meet all the climate goal will be something that set them as kind of leading or even outlier yeah. in the future. Yeah. What's mm. the challenge that you faced as a professional in Asia, balancing 15 countries, the regulations that exist, the cultures, the history that exists, and then you know, one headquarters that has a standard that they're trying to hit. What's the, what's the challenge there? How would you balance that over time? Hmm, that's an interesting question. I, I think actually it's not the different legal requirement in different country that makes it difficult. What hmm. is difficult is sometimes when the brands want to do something and then they may not necessarily have a really strategic plan how mm -hmm. to achieve that goal. Let's say climate yeah. change and everyone wants to reduce energy emission. And then we just announce your supply chain. Now we're going to meet that goal. Right. But then no one really think of how to enable the supplier to meet that goal because these are factory making money from creating product. They don't make mm -hmm. money from reducing carbon emission or they don't make money from reducing worker turnover. There is a huge gap in between. Um, so I think the biggest challenge for me as a professional is uh, managing expectation. Where do you think that miscommunication starts from? Or where do you think that misalignment starts from? If you have like a, a headquarters in EU or US, why are they coming? I mean, because, you know, China in particular often occupies between 40, 60, 80% of a supply chain. It should be mm -hmm. something that I would, I would argue every headquarters should know really well. But do you find that to be the case or do you still struggle to like, look, guys, this is what's actually happening here. We need to align expectations. Do you view that as your role to kind of defend or are you seeing that things are improving because people like yourselves are you know, elevating up into the global headquarters? I think one of the key challenges that we all have to recognize is when a factory is not doing something right, it's not because they don't know what is the right thing. It's because they're asking, do we give them enough business or will there be five years of business going forward so that they want to make this change to align with our business value? At the end of the day, it's just a business decision for them. Yeah. So I think the challenge for uh, the world we are in right now is the geopolitics. A lot of brands want to diversify. A lot yeah. of brands are moving um, from where the country they have been working on for a long time so that it gives them flexibility. They can 
um, give a new order or cut an order from time to time, the flexibility that we expect actually are very contradictory to what the business wants to have a stable business relationship to yeah. justify the investment. I think this is, is the constant struggle. How do you balance that? Or how, like, what do you view as your role to bring balance to that challenge? How we manage our supply chain is changing. In the past, it's more like one size fit all. We have one code mm-hmm. conduct and all the factory, all the supply have to meet this one standard. But that's actually we're moving from that because at the end of the day, maybe only 20% of our factory produce uh, 80% of our product. So we mm-hmm. have to really influence and invest in the factory where we have a lot of business control and a lot of business influence. Yeah. And this is where we, we move the needle. This is where we push the hardest. How much how much of the business do you, of a factory do you need to have to have real influence? Is is there like a number that you found that if you if you hit that you have real influence? It's kind of like rule of thumb if we have like 30 to 40 percent of business in a factory, then we will start to have more influence in that factory. When you think about your own career development, particularly in your early years, what were some of the key takeaways from, say, maybe your first five or eight years of work? How were those roles different? Besides the scorecard, were you able to take with you and say, okay, this is this is going to help me move the needle on, on my next assignment? In the last 10 years, things are changing very quickly. We we just need to manage so many more topics, not only yeah. child labor, forced labor, transparency, fire safety, building safety, and then we have chemical safety, and now we have climate change, we have due diligence. There are yeah. just so many things to manage. So I think as a um, professional, one thing that is very important that we cannot be have a really small comfort zone because our comfort zone keep pushing and expanding we're just mm-hmm. learning every day and then yeah. another thing is i need to know one industry very well for me which is apparel i understand all mm-hmm. the upstream um supplier I, I know how one thing leads to another and that's very right. important yeah as these new trends standards topics expectations come in does this force you to go and learn a whole new set of skills i did a postgrad after I worked in an area, mm-hmm. I did also a uh, manufacturing industry management diploma. And I also did a ESG uh, diploma mm-hmm. last year. So I think okay. learning is just part of our job. How are you deciding what to study? And when you were looking at the, I guess, the academic institution or the accreditation, what were you looking at in terms of, say, their credibility? What were you looking like? I'm going to spend money on this. And I like, how did, how did you assess that? So I did a um, industrial management diploma um, in my first 10 years is because at that point, a lot of brands were thinking about lean management as a solution. Mm. Okay. And that's why I, I, I choose that study. And then um, 10 years ago, I did my postgrad in environmental economics because I see the trend mm. of brands starting to develop environmental program. We, m- many right. of the brands at that stage only have a labor component in their program, but not environments. So I think definitely anticipating trend and educate yeah. myself so that I will able to stay relevant in the future. What is the role of a sustainability director going to be going forward? Are they going to be super technical and work on you know, ESG certifications? Where, where do you see this going? So I definitely anticipate all the focus, all eyes on climate change is being misaligned because the world has a lot of problems, not only climate change. So I will see one or two years from now, people will start to ask, what is the people element in this climate change? What about just transition? So this is something that um, I spend a lot of time thinking and researching about. The second thing is anticipating emerging topics. For example, biodiversity or water crisis, there are a lot of different elements to climate change that we have not talked a lot and think a lot about, but we'll definitely see that coming. And then the last one that I anticipate is a lot of brands have to do a much better job in assurance because greenwashing is what we are talking a lot about. So I think many of us have to do a much better job in proving what we did is Mm. actually credible. How do we deliver more influence? Is it just showing the, the work and proving that we're more efficient? Like how, what's the gap and how, how do we fix it? There are things that we're never able to be improved. For example, if workers are not paid to living wage or the workers have to work 
all this overtime hour to make a, a living, mm -hmm. we could have just paid them more for the regular hour. It's really down to the cost of the product, um, how much consumer is expecting to pay for their clothes for, mm -hmm. or their mug or their chair. If they yeah. expect to pay uh, an e ever decreasing price, and how we're going to pay for that. So I think purchasing practice, it has to be top down because if the company are not aligned with that, then right. our, us as a professional, we will not able to deliver if the company are not thinking about that. How do you think about your own career going forward? You've been going up the corporate ladder. You've had, you've had a number of you know, jumps along the way. Like, are you hopeful that like you become CSO at some point? I know it's a very hot, hot topic right now. <laughs> um, and, and what's, how do you plan your career? Like, how do you look at your career? What are some things that you're like, okay, I, my next step, I want to do this. How, how often are you looking at that? And do you have a pretty clear idea of what your path is? I have some interest of my next step. Actually, um, I have a project that I've been working on for a few years is how to measure social impact quantitatively. Mm -hmm. Because uh, apart from turnover or absenteeism, there is not a lot of proven way to measure um, social improvement. There yeah. are a lot of quantitative indicator available to measure climate change or pollution mm -hmm. and things like that. So this is just my personal passion. Interesting. And in terms of uh, like title, I, I'm not thinking from that perspective because I worked 20 years in, in this industry. I definitely, it's something that I found very attached to and I'm mm -hmm. very passionate about. I'm more about working for a company that believe in it. I don't want to work for a company just because they want to check the box. I don't want to waste my time, to be honest. So I think mm -hmm. just continue to find company that share my value and share my vision in what a meaningful change look like will be, continues to be most important for me. But what keeps you going after so many years in this space? Actually, mm -hmm. um, I was a migrant worker once in my life. Uh, and I got discriminated and I got my um, my money with Paul. I was not registered for social security nine months into my role. That is kind of really so ironic because I work in CSR. I'm so informed of all the law. I'm so informed of my rights. And that happened to me. And so I quit that job uh, because I talked to my boss. I talked to HR. I even talked to labor union. It's the only experience mm -hmm. I have with labor union with my wow. life is to fight for my own discrimination. And yet it, it didn't go anywhere. And so I, I identify myself with migrant worker in Asia, and they are in much less privileged position. They might not even understand their own country labor law, let wow. alone the rights and let alone have the time and luxury to fight for themselves. So I, I feel like I'm advocating on their behalf because I fail my younger self. That's a very personal, tangible link to the work that you're doing. I'm still so angry about it. And every time I talk about it, because I just couldn't believe it happened to me. So mm -hmm. it's something that keep me going. Yeah. So then how do you measure your own success? You have all these different roles. You've done this work. How do you measure your own impact? Actually, mm -hmm. I really love to transform team and help people to find a role in CSR as a practitioner, how to help factory to improve. So I do a lot of uh, team building. So when I see the team that I work with able to transform from just an auditor and go there and do the checklist to someone truly care and have the soft skills to facilitate uh, making better uh, business decision, then this is something I find truly rewarding. With that in mind, what are a few pieces of advice you'd give to a young professional who are coming into the space now and they want to change the world? They want to fix things. What are some pieces of advice you'd give them about developing their career, things to focus on or tools to pick up along the way? So I think the first decision I would ask them to think about is whether they want to be a specialist or a generalist. I consider myself a generalist because I work in business. I need to know a bit of everything. But mm -hmm. if they are not like me, then they may want to know whether they want to work as a um, specialist in NGO or as a consultant or a service provider, measure energy emission 
Like、mm. there is something that they have to be truly passionate about because、um, most of the work we do, we only study very little about it. What we right. when we are、right. actually working on the problem, we have to problem solve because we are truly curious about what's the better way to do business.